Afternoon, gentlemen. Afternoon. Here we are. We've got Paul Millington on our right, and we've got Dave Bryan. Uh, both have been chairman of the club. Um, Dave, you was the first ever chairman of the Enfield Supporters Trust, yeah. and, and the, the original when Enfield Town were formed. And then you managed to find a victim to pass it on to, and, yeah. and, and it was the man to your left that, that you chose. And you know, Paul Whittington was chairman, taking us from Brimsdale up to the QE Stadium. From obscurity to success. Yes. But we did used to win trophies. <laughs> <laughs> if we start with the first chairman of Enfield Town Football yeah. Club Day, what, how did that come about? Can you give us a little bit of insight to maybe what yeah, a lot I of mean, supporters aren't aware of? I mean, I've been an Enfield fan since I was eight or nine. So my first game at the Old Sapphire Road in 1968 was a regular at Enfield from the 70s onwards. And Enfield was always my team. It wasn't my second team, it was my team. And as, as you go through life at different times, sometimes you, you, you spend more time watching the football than, than, than you do at others. But I've always been an Enfield fan. Sometimes that meant going home and away, sometimes just home games. But when, uh, when the club decided to uh, to sell Southbury Road, um, I really felt motivated to make a stand on that and to, and, and, and to, and to fight it because I thought it was a terrible, terrible decision to move from South, Southbury Road. And I worked closely with Paul from that moment onwards really in fighting the campaign to stop Enfield Football Club selling Southbury Road because I thought it was a, it was a tragedy. Um, we didn't win that particular battle, and uh, you know that's a, that's 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 a great shame. But we weren't going to let it lie there. You know, even even when we lost that battle, we tried to save Enfield Football Club, uh, and we did spend two years trying to save Enfield Football Club before we concluded that there was no way to save Enfield Football Club, and we didn't have any choice but to uh, yeah, because because the grounds were sold, weren't they? The yeah. grounds were sold, and you know, almost within weeks of the season being over, the bulldozers were in, yeah. and they were being dug up, and, and the club were forced outside the borough for, like you said, for, well, for two, at least two years, yeah. uh, while the original, while the supporters were still involved with the Enfield Football Club, and we had to travel to what places like where, yes. St Albans, Warwick, Bishop Stortford, yeah. Bishop Stortford, all over South Hertfordshire and North London. And it, it wasn't fun going to games anymore. We weren't talking about who's going to be playing centre forward and you know what a great display it was by a, a, you know a midfielder or a defence that day. It was all about what's happening off the pitch. When are we coming back to Enfield? And it just became an unenjoyable event to go to football. Yeah. And I think that's one of the reasons when we got exasperated. Exasperated is easy for me to say. Mm -hmm. uh, um, with the efforts that we were making uh, to try and bring that club back, uh, we we actually had a signed agreement with the owner at one time to take for the Sporters Trust to take over Enfield FC. Uh, but he renegated on that, and we thought, well, we can't do this anymore. Uh, I certainly stopped going to games at Borrowwood because it's a not enjoyable. It wasn't an enjoyable day out. Mm. Um, and but once we started our own club, people started talking about the sense of game. We're talking about what's happening on the pitch. And that's what it should be all about. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you brought the club, well, you brought the team back to the borough. I mean, Enfield was still kicking the football about somewhere in other parts of the southeast. And we, you know, you guys are leading the way um, and forming Enfield Town FC. You brought football back into the borough. Um, how did that? Evolve. How did that happen? How was Enfield Town formed? We was, we was incredibly fortunate that uh, support, the organisation of supporters direct came into being about that time. And we got a tremendous lot of advice and support. But even they was a bit taken aback at the decision to, to say, right, we're set our links with the old Enfield and start again. We held a meeting at, at Brimstone Sports and Social Club of supporters and we outlined the plans that we thought the negotiations had fallen apart and that we felt the only way to bring football back to Enfield, because the old Enfield FC had no intention of coming to Enfield. We thought the only way to do that is to start again. It meant dropping four divisions. You know, 
uh, as a massive, a massive job. But we felt that was better than carry on uh, supporting a club who had no, no intention of ever playing in Enfield again. So we put that to the supporters at that meeting and, and, the, and the guy from Supporters Direct said, God, are you really sure about this, guys? <laughs> you know, he was quite taken, quite taken aback. But we were sure about it because we'd spent two years trying to save the old club and we'd got, no, we'd got nowhere and it was the only, it was the only option left to us. And, and also an uh, important element of that was that was we were we were privy to uh, the finances of that club and we knew that it was doomed. Mm. You know, then it was you know, sadly to be proven right a few years later when they were wound up. Yeah. But you know, they had huge debts, uh, and that's something we as a sports trust were going to take on. The intention was to take on the ownership of the Lion League and the FA at the time, so we would leave the debts in that company. Um, but it wasn't to be. And we thought, well, do you want to carry on watching the club? It's going to slowly die. Is that what's going to happen to it? Or do we start again? And uh, uh, yeah, you know, democratically put it to the members and uh, post the ballot and uh, overwhelming majority to start again. Yeah, I think the figures were 92%. Yeah, it was, so, no, it was 9 to 1, the vote. Yeah. To, to, was to so separate to the old yeah. and, and start okay. here, even though it meant dropping four divisions. Yeah. And that was dropping from what was the Ryman Premier League to the Essex Senior League and our fans were absolutely fantastic and we were fortunate in that we had a lot of people who had been involved even with Enfield in the conference haven't we who, who people like Roy Butler, people like Roger Reed, people people who had run at the top non-league club throwing throwing that throwing that full weight into the new club mm. and the supporters were absolutely fantastic. You know, they didn't bat an eyelid the fact that they were playing teams some had never even heard of. And, and I think the first season was one of the most memorable seasons that we ever had. I mean, the football probably wasn't the greatest quality. Some of the grounds we went to were quite frank, frankly basic, let's say. Yeah. Uh, but it was a fantastic season. And people enjoyed it again. It was fun again. Mm. It was fun to go and watch an Enfield team play. Yeah. And we nearly, we nearly got promotion that first season. Um, and we was we was on the way back, you know. It, you know, it wasn't it wasn't all all positive. There were some big, big negatives to deal with that year, but we dealt with them all, and they were made us stronger in the end. Yeah. But the first one was forgetting the uh, corner flags for the first game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's um, you mentioned Roy Butler and Roger Reed, and it's fair to say when you've got guys like that, or the late Roy Butler now, that um, when you've got guys like that, the expertise they actually offer was actually priceless, I'd yeah. imagine. Yeah. Yeah. I remember having a ball meeting in a changing room at Brimstown, yeah. and we talked about everything from who was going to get those corner flags, <laughs> <laughs> to uh, getting an ice cream wagon in to provide some catering, yeah. to who was going to manage the team, how they were going to manage the team, how we were going to fund the team. We took we covered everything. And some of those ball wings went on for a very long, very long time. Um, but we were talking, yeah, yeah. But you know, in those days, we had to cover everything. You know, and uh, you know, a brim's down. We had to rope the ground off before every game, take the hoardings down after every game. Yeah. But with the enthusiasm we had. And, and the number of people involved, I mean, we always moan that we could do with more volunteers, mm. but we've got so many more than many other clubs. And in that first season, so many people chipped in to do that bit. You yeah. know, it was a, definitely an example of how a lot of people combining together can produce something that no one or two individuals can do. It was a very much a team effort. Yeah. Yeah. It was a fantastic experience to be honest. Yeah, and we set up at Brimsdown, um, we, we developed their ground, we created a little stadium there. Yeah. Didn't have our own bar income, so we had to rely on gate receipts, was that right? It was, but you know, against the fact that we had no bar income, we didn't pay any rent. Right. You know, so swings around about. And there had to be something in it for Broomstown as well. It couldn't be all one way. Yeah. And, you know, and without Broomstown Sports and Social Club, there wouldn't be no in for town. Yeah, uh, and we have got a great debt to, to play to from the point of view of how they, how they helped us. Um, and you know, some of the individuals there went an extra you know, mile to make sure that happened for Brims. You know, from the point of view, they saw the benefit for Brims now. Mm. Um, and it was beneficial for them as well. Yep. Now, there's been a lot of things in the media recently about West Ham being given a stadium. Yep. 
for you know, outrageous. To, outrageous. Yeah. But on the smaller scale, mm. well, on a vastly smaller scale, Enfield Town were given the stadium. You was chairman at the time, Paul, mm. when that evolved yeah. and, and that surfaced. How did that happen? How did, did how did Enfield Town, ground sharing with Brimsdown, move well, to then being given a stadium? Well, we've got a lot of money to that. Well, I was going to say that uh, uh, um, it's, it's different to the West Ham scenario as well, so as far as I know, as, uh, as I understand it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there was a tender process for this stadium. You may, you know, the other club applied for it. There was also interest by another uh, um, uh, a leisure uh, company as well for it. Mm. So we had to what, take it, send it to the council the details of what our business plan, what our usage would be, what the community benefit would be. And we spent a lot of time putting that together and getting that right. Um, and so that was the first step. And then having done that, we then had to, so everything that you see that Enfield Town actually used has been paid for by Enfield Town and Football Stadium Improvement Fund. Right. Okay, so the floodlights, you know, the changing rooms, um, the ballroom, the bar, that has been paid for by, by us as a club together with the assistance from the SFIA. In total, Enfield Town have bought three quarters of a million pounds to this project. Well, wow. you know, and, oh, it wasn't a lot of that wasn't directly our money, but it was money that they could council or anybody else could have accessed without the involvement of a football club. Mm -hmm. They could have chosen another football club, but we brought, we brought a lot to this project, and without Enfield Town's involvement, this project would have never happened. And I think what Going back a little bit, when we tried to save the old football club, Paul and I were both involved in working with the council to try and find them a ground in the borough of Enfield. Mm -hmm. Despite the fact that the owner of that club was lukewarm on that idea. Yeah. Uh, but in that time, so that's from 99 onwards, we developed a relationship with the council where they knew that our motive wasn't to, was nothing other than to get a football club playing in the borough. Mm -hmm. And I think they respected our position and they were prepared to work with us, and I think that stood us in good stead because they that they knew that that's what, all we were about. We weren't looking to turn this into some money-making initiative or anything like that. Our motive was to get football back into the borough of Enfield at senior level, and we worked very well with the council. Didn't we? Sometimes we were frustrated by the speed and pace, but to be honest, uh, you know, looking around, not many local authorities have worked as closely with their football clubs as Enfield Council has. And that's both administrations, the previous Conservative administration and the new Labour administration, both worked well with this football club. Yeah. Yeah. And law may continue. You know. Yes, so, yeah. and we had the leader of the council here today, thoroughly enjoyed the, the game. Uh, you know, we continue to have close ties with the council. Uh, you know, we share the building with them. Mm -hmm. And one of the um, aspects of the development here was there was uh, football foundation money that was put into the playfields to deal with the drainage and improve the number of pitches on there. Uh, and there's a football development plan that we're involved with the council, um, and we've exceeded our targets in terms of how many teams are now playing out there. You know, I think one of the wonderful things about the club is how it's been built from the youth sections as well, um, boys and girls, and obviously very uh, you know, uh, large. Uh, section of the you know, babies uh, team as well, but uh, you know, so it is a community club for the United Kingdom. Yeah. Well, th th well, we've spoken about the old Enfield and briefly, and the involvement of Enfield Town uh, moving from Brimsdown to QE. We had the first game here, the inaugural game here, which we all remember, where we played at Tottenham side. At the time, we thought, oh, look what sort of team they've sent down to play us. But actually, included now an England international with Andros Townsend on the wing. Um, do you think that Spurs could send down a team a little bit more often to play their smaller brothers around the block? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it, 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 would, it would be nice. I, th I think the amount of money concentrated in the pre Premier League uh, is absolutely phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And I think all those clubs should do more to support football at grassroots, grassroots level. And Tottenham have sent the team to play us twice and we're very grateful to that. Mm. Um, but I do think generally, top Premier League clubs should do a lot more to support football at different levels in, in, in this country. Mm. And 
It's a bit disappointing that they don't, to be honest. I mean, it'd be quite easy, quite easy. For example, I'm just picking Tottenham because they're our nearest neighbours. Yes. It applies equally to Arsenal or West Ham, I'm sure. Mm. You know, Tottenham rarely play on a Saturday. It'd be quite, they could quite easily make more of an effort to promote Enfield Town, but, uh, you know, that's the reality, that's expecting too too much. Yeah, well, we don't have a bad relationship to them, but, it, it, but, it, but it, it, I would like to see it be even stronger, to be honest. Because a lot of our supporters, you know, consider themselves Spurs and Arsenal fans, or Spurs and, or sorry, not Spurs and Arsenal fans, no one does that. <laughs> uh, Enfield Town and Arsenal, or Enfield yes. Town and Spurs. Yes. And, you know, we're not competitive to them, far from it, but I, I'd like to see Premier League clubs, because of the vast amount of wealth that's thrown at them, TV money, make more of an effort to support the game at grassroots level. Yeah, here, here, and if they're watching this video, come on boys, sort it out <laughs> and send the team yeah. down. Okay. As two prominent guys involved deeply with the club, we know Paul Reid is now the chairman, um, but you two guys are very much in, you know, in, in, the, in the spine of the club, in sort of administration. Where do you see the future? I mean, we talked about the past, the future, um, how do you see us maybe in five years' time? Or... Five years' time, I'll see us completing at the top level of, of uh, conference. National? Sure. South now. That's, that's I, I think we've been knocking on the door of the conference. The conference nationally, you need to remember, is full time clubs. Mm. Okay? Um, with you know, massive stadiums. They're all ex football league clubs like so Tranmere, Wrexham, Lincoln. With, you know, a, a, huge amount of backing. What you have to remember is that we've lost a generation of support since the old club lost the Saturday night. We're gradually building it up now. Uh, we're gradually building the awareness in Enfield that there's a football club that plays at a decent level, plays attractive football, you have a great day out. Uh, but we've lost that, you know, and we're starting to build it up again. And to compete at national level would mean probably increasing our turnover 10 times. Right. I'm not saying that we can't do that in time, but you've got to do it gradually in, in, in a way that's sustainable. Mm. Um, there's no point just going for it and then trying to do it. So, for example, the first two years we struggled in this league. In the last two years, you know, last year should be in the playoffs, this year we still could be. Mm. So you know, we, we are building, but I think you know, we will get into the next level up, you know, probably at least sooner rather than later. Mm. But then you've got to build up for the next level. And there's a whole lot of uh, stadium improvements that are required as well. We have to pay for that. And so, you know, to be, don't run before you can walk in. Yeah, it, yes. We would need a new social facility to build up the income to yeah. be able to sustain a team at the next level. You know, and you can see teams like Brentshire have done it fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, but we would need to do more than we couldn't do it where we are at the moment. What we have in terms of income streams. Uh, and, <coughs> and where do you guys stand? Do you stand with it being the current model as we see it, a supporter's own totally? Do you see someone who's willing to put big money into the club? If they did, how would that work? Well, <coughs> look, look, look back at Enfield FC. I mean, Enfield FC uh, in the 70s and 80s was a football club, and it was chairman, Tommy Umbrey, yeah. who no doubt invested a lot of his personal wealth into the club, but he didn't just throw money at the football team, he built an infrastructure that could support a football team, could support a football team that could compete with anyone outside the league, and was probably better than most fourth or third division sides. You know, the old Enfield of the early 80s. To the younger supporters, that's League One and League Two. Yeah, indeed, <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for the translation. But in, 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 and he did that by, you know, by building an infrastructure that could, 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 could wash its own face, if you like. Mm. You know, the people who came after him weren't as successful as that. And we saw the other side of the, of the one, one person ownership model. Mm. I think the fans' own model works well at this level. I think it would, I think it would sustain us in the conference south. Um, beyond that, we would have to massively grow our fan base for it to work. If you can get 1,500 people coming, you, you can get to the conference national on a fan base model. But you need you need to build the club to, 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 to do that. You, you couldn't, I don't think, fund the conference side with a fan base of 300, however generous yeah. and, and, and supportive they, they were. You need to massively expand that, that fan base. But certainly at conference south level, I think we could take it, we take it forward. I mean, if someone came in tomorrow and said, I'm going to invest £2 million into this club, 
I mean, as they come on board, would would study that very carefully, look at carry out necessary due diligence, and and at the end of the day, we will put it to all our members, and it would be up to ordinary members, or yeah. 250 of them, to say, yeah, we like that what that person's proposing or not, and it could work brilliantly, or it might fall apart. You know, there's a team who was promoted from the Ryman Premier League only a short while ago, who are now in Conference South, or National League South, I should mm -hmm. learn to call it, and for whatever reason, the people who invested a massive amount of money in that club have decided that that's no longer for them, and they're pulling the plug away. Yes. So you've always got, you've always got, you know, that, that risk. That, that pitfall. You know, yeah. and you might progress quicker, but I think the fan zone model means you progress at a med model that you can, at a sustainable level. You know, I would rather have spent another two seasons in this division and then go up and stay up, than yeah. go up this season and come down. Yeah. I'm not saying that's what would happen, but I think it's important to continue to progress up not always possible, but that's a better model than those clubs. You see it with clubs that really haven't got the fan base to support you. Someone throws money at it, they march through the leagues, yeah. and then as soon as they disappear, possibly for genuine reasons, they come back down again. Yeah, yeah. 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 good fun. Yeah, I see yeah. good fun at the time. Yeah, you know, yeah. fed up with it. I think the, 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 the point there is we are in our own stadium, 99 year old leagues. Mm. Uh, we marched us in our own destiny. If we mess it up, it's our fault. You know, pass with the crowd, you know, you share the ground, and you've, you've, you've got to negotiate with the council about extending leases every so often. We can put all that behind us. You know, subject to just one bill that's left, which you've got the majority of the money for, then this stadium is all paid for. So I've been five years of moving to this stadium. We've paid for everything. So there's been a huge amount of investment, not just here, but remember we also built a ground at Grimsdown as well. Yeah. So we built two grounds in our existence. And now, instead of having to think about the infrastructure, which we will have to do hopefully in terms of just extending seating, etc., you know, we can then put that money into the team. Yeah. And, uh, so we should march on. Yeah. I think you know the future, next five years, yeah, very positive. Yep, so if it Conclusion, if there is a money man out there, come forward, speak to us. And if you're a similar mindset and well, gradual, gradual, natural yeah, no, progression. The bottom line is, I think we will never surrender the ownership of the ground mm. to a simple investor. No. That no. Will, our, our constitution does not allow that. So you, you can't, there's what's called uh, an asset lobby, yes. which the members voted for. So it means the ground will always be owned by the supporters. Yes. So if someone came in, substantial investor, they want to take the football club forward, uh, it's a good test for them because clearly there's nothing in them for there's nothing in it for them in terms of uh, the opportunity to develop a site for something else. That's not open for them. So that's a good test. Yeah. If they're prepared to swallow that, then I think we're listening to them. But I have to say, unless Paul's kept it quiet, <laughs> we've not been inundated no, with no, offers no. of people wanting to throw vast amount of money. There, there have been people that have said, oh, I'm interested in investing, so you're like, okay, what's, what, what do you want to invest? What's your, what's your plan? What, what's in it for you? And you don't hear anymore. Mm. Yeah. And I think that's been a, yeah. a good indication as to that what their true purpose is. You know, well, we can't find that out. But it's, uh, um, you expect anybody that going to put some money in that you need to do it for the right reasons. And, and why not just buy your pound share in, in, in the trust like everyone else? Yeah. And put money in like everyone else? Yeah. There is one thing I'd like to say. Since day one, we've had, a, we've, had a, we've had a scheme whereby supporters can make a monthly donation to this club. And I think it's one of the things that set us apart from the very first day. And so we've got a number of supporters who've been doing that for 15 years now. And over the last season, we've been fortunate enough to recruit a few more. And it's, it's fantastic. I mean, it gives the club a regular monthly income, 12 months of the year. Mm. And some people contribute five pounds, some contribute 75 pounds or more. Mm. But it's a fantastic way of demonstrating your support to the club. And I know it's not appropriate or relevant for everybody, but for those that can, yeah. that, that, that monthly contribution is what is what is the other side of fan ownership. You know, it's not just about saying, oh yeah, we're a fan owned, we're fans owned, that's it. It's about taking the responsibility for, for owning your club. And hey, even the guys who, who paid the £10 membership, and I'm pleased to see that our membership is, is steadily growing, 
you know, that's a fantastic contribution. So for any Enfield Town fan out there who for whatever reason, probably just that they've never been asked, mm -hmm. isn't yet a member, if you do one thing this summer, join the, the Supporters Society so that next season you're on board as one of our owners. Yep. Um, one thing we haven't really blown out of the top of the rooftops is that we are the first supporters run and own senior football club under the Supporters Direct initiative uh, in the UK. And other clubs who've had a lot more publicity about it have sort of taken all the plaudits. Um, I remember going up to the National Museum, the Football Museum, and spoke to an expert up there. And I asked him, do you know who the first supporters own and run club is? And he turned around and said to me, oh, that's Wimbledon. And I said, no, oh, you're wrong. You know, you're not such an expert. <laughs> Could we do a bit more about publicising that? And also, what other sort of clubs have actually followed our model? Well, that's been a, uh, in terms of publicity, I think we're always going to be second best to teams that have got a bigger support. We've got three times our support. Mm. Um, and then, obviously, FC United was a big story as well. So those two probably grab the headlines when it comes to the fans and own clubs. And Wimbledon was a great story from where they had to start. Yeah, so fantastic. fantastic. Yeah. Well, yeah. they're a great model for everyone else to follow. Yeah. Portsmouth as well have done fantastically well. Um, well, we do try and shout it out. Yeah. But, you know, um, um, it's very difficult sometimes just to you know, break out. And that's one of the difficulties I think we have as a club is getting ourselves known and much higher in the profile. I think the way that we need to do that is on the pitch. And um, that's what we frustrating this year. We didn't quite reach the first round of the FA Cup. Yeah. Because that's when you can start getting in the national press. Mm -hmm. Enfield Town, the first ever sports owner, club, are now in the first round of the FA Cup, 15 years after formation. You know, great story. Yeah. So it's all down to Brad, really. To make yeah. Sure that <laughs> I mean, I, I have every sympathy for Wimbledon. I think, I think it was a terrible decision of the FA to allow. Uh, another club to take that club and move them 60 miles north and I think it was outrageous. So I, I totally support what AFC Wimbledon would have done and I, I, you know, I'm, I'm delighted that they've enjoyed the success that they have. Um, I do wonder if it would have ever happened if we had done what we've done. We've done. Yeah. I, I, I don't know if it would have even been on the radar to do that. It may have done, it may not. But certainly, certainly the guys who were involved in AFC Wimbledon at the time were very appreciative of what support we could offer them and the fact that they could demonstrate to a lot of their fans, look, if a team like Enfield can do it, yeah. so, could, so could we. So I'd like to think we helped them in that predicament. Uh, and, you know, I, I don't envy them the success that they've achieved. It's one, you know, it's one of the greatest stories ever told, getting them from the combined counties league to the football league. Yes, lovely progression there. And it's good to see them back into the league. Um, no, that's, that's great. Now, we've, we've spoken about the club, uh, the old club, the new club. Um, you've told us a lot of the history for maybe what a lot of the young supporters and new supporters maybe are totally unaware of. And I think they'll be very appreciative of that insight. If we talk about you now as supporters, um, what's your greatest memory of Enfield FC? Tell you what, what I I mean, I went to Amica Cup finals, FA Trophy finals, but I tell you, the day that sticks out in my mind is when we went to Leicester City. Um, yes. You know, about Gary Abbott, otherwise we won. Yeah, well, quite, quite possibly. <laughs> but it, it, it was an incredibly emotional day, you know, and it was fantastic. There was about 2,000 people from Enfield had gone to the game, which added to the whole atmosphere of the occasion. They were a Premier League side, and, you know, we gave a fantastic account of ourselves. And to me, that even topped some of the Wembley appearances, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, I just thought, as a fan, it was a fantastic experience. I'm mm -hmm. um, a night at the Hawthorns when we won the FA Trophy against the replay. Yeah, yeah. That, that was a special night, especially coming back to, to the club and enjoying the evening in the clubhouse that night. That was, uh, yeah. that was, that was good. That was good. Great game mm -hmm. uh, in, in terrible conditions. Everything about it was just fantastic. Yeah, and it was strange, really, because the first game, was a uh, uh, worse uh, yeah. worst like, trophy final. Yeah. You know, it was a bit of a ball draw, nil-nil. Yeah. And I've also beaten Barnett 7-0. Yeah, that was perfection on the football. <laughs> it, it, really was, and you know, I still say to this day that the Barnett goalkeeper had played a blinder that day. To <laughs> that. He did. He was the man of the match by a long way. 
But another great day out, of course, was uh, going back a bit further, 1980, was the trip to Barnsley. Barnsley were top of the third division, managed by the former Leeds United player, Norman Hunter. Yeah. And at Barnsley, we gave a real run for their money. We had, I think, two or three goals disallowed, had the lion's share of the game, but found ourselves 1-0 down going into the 89th minute where Peter Burton rose like a salmon to hit the equaliser. <laughs> yeah. And just amazing. Yeah, I was going to get a goal there. Amazing. Who do you owe that to? You've, you've, you've enjoyed that history, that, that first, or the most memorable moment. How did you become Enfield supporters in the first place? Well, I think I, my dad took me to a game in 1968. Uh, it was against Woking, and I've sub subsequently looked up the exact date, so it was October 1968, and we beat Woking 4 1. And I can still remember saying to him at one point, Oh, I don't think they're having half time today. It seems like they're going straight all the way through. Because yeah. an eight year old, yeah. an hour and a half is a long time to stand watching a football match. Yeah, yeah. But that, that got my interest going. And then in the early 70s, I started going very, very regularly on my own, which you could do in those days. It was a nice, safe, friendly yes. environment. Uh, and that's when I bumped into this character. And it become slightly less safe and friendly. <laughs> <laughs> and Paul? Well, um, confession time. Um, I used to go to Arsenal um, um, uh, from eight years old. My dad used to go to Arsenal, granddad used to go to Arsenal, coming from Islington. Uh, um, but living in Edmonton at the time. Uh, and this was sort of in the 70s where going to football wasn't necessarily much a pleasant experience. Mm. And getting the bus from Edmonton uh, up to Finchley Park to go and watch a game uh, uh, through Tottenham territory with a red and white scarf on was getting the chest and it was a um, and sadly, I was only, my, my dad passed away, mum wasn't keen for me to keep on going. I went to school, Kingsmead, saw this ground there, spoke to you know, a few of my mates at school were going along, so I started going there from age 14. Yeah, yeah. and you become influential supporters. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, your greatest memory of Enfield FC, what's your greatest memory of Enfield Town FC? Um, Strange one, but it was uh, um, our first ever game here, and uh, we were playing um, in the middle sets. Yeah, 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 yeah. in the middle sets, Sydney Cup, I think it was, yeah. or Charity Cup, it was a Charity Cup, mm. and it was the first game we were And we spent all day here getting things ready, getting glasses delivered for the bar, and I was uh, putting a, <laughs> the ladies' toilet sign up. <laughs> <laughs> Did you, what, did you volunteer for that one? Yeah, I did. Yeah, 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 I'm sure the sort of thing that uh, you know, Brandish does as well at Chelsea. Uh, up on a step ladder, doing this yeah. side. Yeah. And I heard the first turnstile click as the first person came in yeah. to the ground. And I thought, crikey, we've done it. We've got our own ground and people coming in to, 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 to play to watch our games. And that, for me, was the best moment for everyone in town. Because I, I knew what it, this meant to get our own stadium yeah. and, and how we could kick on from here. So that was just a strange one, and the toilet size fallen off since then. <laughs> David? Yeah, it's, 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 there's been so many quite moving, quite emotional moments. Coming here has to be a part of it. Coming to this ground. Big in the book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Always making some reference there because. We, in our original discussions with the council, there wasn't going to be a running track. You know, um, the, the leader of the council at the time, I remember, said to me one day, said, oh, they've got a track up at Lee Valley Sports, they don't need a track here, it'll be a football stadium. Mm -hmm. And then, I don't know if the two things were connected in the medium run up to the Olympics, the same person suddenly decided that they did need a running track here. And hey, it's not, it's been a problem that, well, not even been a problem, it's been something that we've been able to absorb when it adds to the character of the place. So I have no, no problem with that. But, but when, when uh, Paul first explained to me that the council is insisting on keeping on a running track, uh, I, I said, oh, oh, it's oh yeah, I can do that occasionally. I said, <laughs> this isn't a pig in a poke, let's <laughs> stay at Brimsdown. Bad decision. Yeah. I like to remind them every so often. Yeah, unfortunately, <laughs> the more sensible members of the boards realised that I was just having a strop. <laughs> and, uh, and 
and uh, you know, the rest is history. We're, we're here, we've accommodated the track, it's not a problem, I don't think, for the football. Um, and it, you know, maybe it adds to the character of the place, maybe not, I don't know, but maybe it does. And it's, got, it's great to be here. I can't help but think about one of the two of the individuals who, who never got here. Yeah, yeah, they've been they're, they're be mentioned in, in many of our interviews. Yeah. You know, I mean, Ron, Ron Sturgis and um, Roy Butler. Yeah. Yeah, didn't see a ball kicked here yet. They're putting so much yeah. Yeah. effort in, in, in get, getting us here. Well, so I was pleased that um, Roy did get here before we had an open day once the show went around. Yeah. And Roy did get here for that, so, you know, I'm pleased that he saw that. And yeah, and Ronnie worked on the beach. Yeah, of course he did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but yeah. I'm sure they're looking down on us up there and, and supporting us still in, in, in spirit. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. Gentlemen, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. I know there's a player of the year award upstairs. Yeah. We'll let you get away with that and um, enjoy the evening.